All right, I think we're getting ready to start. Um, warm welcome to the first Stockholm Data Science webinar. Really glad to have so many people here. Um, today we will talk about how to quantify image similarity and how we can use deep learning uh, for that purpose. Uh, you can use it, for example, for content search and clustering and similar tasks. Um, and we'll delve down into the, the practical understanding um, and how the images are actually represented within the neural networks. Uh, so that will be very interesting. Uh, the setup for today is that we will have a 30 minutes presentation uh, and then we will have a 10 minutes question and answer session. Uh, and in regards to the questions, uh, I hope you all can find a form where you can ask your questions uh, and do feel free to, uh, to type them in whenever you come up with them. You don't have to wait until the end. Um, and um, we will then read out your questions out loud. Um, also, other participants cannot see your questions, so feel free to ask anything you like. Um, when it comes to the organizers, it's uh, me, uh, David Dryden, uh, and my colleague, Philip Westberg, uh, from uh, the data consultancy, uh, Solita, that is making uh, this Stockholm Data Science Meetup happening. Um, and we're really happy to introduce our guest. Um, he has experience in computational fluid dynamics, and he also holds a PhD in mechanical engineering from KTH. Uh, but currently, he is a tech writer at the AI startup uh, Pultarium. Uh, really glad to have Roman Fetrusinski here. Uh, a warm welcome. Yeah, thanks. Uh, should I co go on then with the rest of it? Go ahead. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, thanks a lot uh, for inviting me, and uh, thanks for uh, everyone to connect uh, and listen to this. Um, yeah, like David said, I kind of changed careers because I really like neural networks and there's something I like even more is like um, nice images. Um, so I couldn't pass an um, opportunity to talk about image similarity and deep learning. Uh, so I've got a lot to say, but I will try to keep it within the time. And so my plan is to uh, go a bit of uh, uh, what it means image similarity for me and what kind of ideas I have when I think about it and then try to see how uh, deep learning kind of comes naturally for, for this topic. I, I mean there's many methods of computers and everything that you could do so why deep learning in specifically? Um, I will try to, to say why I think it's particularly fitted and uh, how at the end I will have also a bit more specifics about how to work with it and more concrete, uh, more and more concretely what you can uh, do actually. Um, so yes, it goes, so maybe start with image similarity. I mean, similarity is like a weird, uh, it's a bit of a vague term. So my definition would be this or explanation would be to say it's a way to compare images uh, to know if they share similar content. And if you think that's a pretty bad definition, I won't really blame you. Like you don't really know much more after that, I think. Uh, and I think one big problem is this similar content um, that is not really well defined. Uh, so if I showed you two, two pairs of images, uh, like, like all these pairs here, you, I could ask anyone and say, don't you think these are similar? Yeah, yeah, probably you would just say, yeah, they're similar. Um, and so we get an idea that, okay, if these two are similar, maybe resolution doesn't matter, like the color doesn't matter, uh, maybe the style even doesn't matter, maybe the object in the image doesn't really matter, like this, uh, and still the images could be similar. So there's an idea behind this similar, it, it means there's like a semantics, it's like what it means to, to someone when you watch the image, um, there's, there's a kind of a deeper meaning uh, that makes them similar or not. Uh, but it, it's, it doesn't come necessarily from just the specifics of the image, like a pixel level. It, it's something, it helps for sure, but th there's something else as well. Um, but I say also it's a way to compare images and 
comparison, this I really like because this, if I get a method that says, okay, here are two images, um, and I compare them and the result is, I don't know, 98.647% similar. Uh, now I've got like a, a precise measure that gives me numbers um, for this vague concept of similarity, but now I, I get a number that is precise and if I show these two images, it will always be the same. So now I can start actually, I've got something that's kind of reliable so I can build systems around it. Uh, so what can you do if you can quantify uh, exactly this similarity. Uh, I mean, the, the first idea that comes uh, maybe most straightforward is like a reverse search thing. And I, it's really kind of, um, it, it, it's really Im important in my mind because I remember when I was a kid and the internet came and all I could do was, or all I wanted to do was to search for uh, images of Lord of the Rings. And then I remember you had to type keywords into the search engine and then you would find your picture. Uh, and these keywords, it was like so important to find the right keywords and I could sit and think, okay, if someone has made a website that I want to find with images, like what keywords would they have used? And I, I would have to really think a lot on how to even spell them, otherwise I would not find them. Uh, but then, of course, I would download all the images I could find and then I'd look, look at them offline, then maybe I get, uh, oh, this cool picture of a dragon, uh, but I didn't write down where it came from or anything and now I want to learn more about it. Uh, like if I, what keyword can I use? Like dragon, if I search the internet for dragon, like good luck finding this particular image. Where, where does it come from? I, I'll never find it again. So like the reverse search is pretty good that you, um, you would show just the image and then you get the more or less the keywords back. Um, so it's like super useful application. Um, and you could do it maybe, okay, from an image you can get information, like what is this object? Uh, but maybe you're not, you can extend it a bit and maybe you're not interested in the keyword or whatever, you just want to know where can I buy it? Uh, or is someone else using the same um, uh, the same thing as me? Uh, so if you just apply the same kind of technique just by being able to quantify how two things, are, how much two things are similar, then you, you can find this. Uh, it's kind of ex what I would say is a bit exploring uh, what's available. Uh, I mean, with similarity, you can touch a bit or some, you start touching on face recognition and then you could use it for like security applications or you could make just a funny app uh, that finds things that look more or less the same. Um, you could also not do it with people, but with uh, kind of landmarks. And then when you take a picture with your smartphone, uh, of course, your smartphone will happily tell you, this is this monument, it's called uh, this, and uh, you are exactly here in the world and so on. Um, so you could do all this stuff and basically this all comes down from the ability, ability to compare things. Um, and if you have this measure as well, what you could do that maybe is uh, uh, for data science is uh, you could go a bit one step further and then everyone in your own applications, you might find uses for it and you just filter it a bit and try to group things using this measure and uh, do some data clustering and maybe find patterns in, in, that you couldn't see before in the data that you have. Um, so, I mean, I hope everyone gets their own uh, kind of ideas of oh, what you could do if you, if you get this system and that's okay, we want to get started. Um, but okay, actually how, how to get started and how to do this search? Um, so if I start to think, okay, these two images, I want to compare them. Uh, okay, I could do it pixel by pixel. I don't know, average image, maybe it's like something like a me megapixel. So if I compare everything, I, I will have one million operations at least. So that's, I, I know already that's gonna take a while to compute on my CPU. Um, I could find, okay, what do I do specifically to compare them is I could find key points maybe. And I know there are libraries like OpenCV and all this. I could find the eyes, I could find, I don't know, uh, key points on my image. I could try to realign them, do all sorts of things. Uh, that's possible. Then I could look at uh, histograms of color distribution and so on. And also, I mean, there are methods, right, that would probably allow me to do that. And I could learn how to do them and, and um, implement them. But already I suspect that it's gonna be slow and that I'm gonna have to do a lot of research. 
and I'm a bit lazy and I think, okay, what if next year the big thing is something that's not image, like, but I get texts all of a sudden, uh, or I get, I don't know, bank records or music or customer profiles or anything else. Then all the techniques I've learned, uh, well, I mean, they, they, they're good and they serve their purpose, but now I need to start from scratch with some different methods. Um, so, from just thinking like that, I have two big problems that come to my mind that kind of slap me in the face from thinking about it for two minutes, is that comparing images, especially images, because of all the pixels, it's going to be slow. And also, I'm still stuck kind of this similar aspect. It's still not very specific, so I'm still not really sure what even I would do. Um, but, you know, we want to get going. It's a kind of hot thing, so let's try to figure out what we can do. So first, uh, we're going to try to make comparison fast. And to do that, I've got an idea. Uh, if I want to compare, or I don't have an idea, but there's an idea. Um, if you want, if you have two images and you want to compare them, you don't compare them directly. First, you're going to compress them, and you're going to compare the compressed version of the images. And since the compressed version will be a lot smaller, I don't know, an image typically, maybe a six megabytes, if you could compress it to one kilobyte, even just from reading the data from disk, it's going to be a lot less data. So even just from that point of view, it's got to be faster. Um, so I think that would help a lot. Um, so I, I would say, okay, now I feel a bit confident I can make search fast. Uh, now the, the other big problem uh, here is like similar, like what do I do? What specifically, what will I compare? What will I implement? So we need to get this quantification out of similarity. And so I have this idea now that Okay, I get an image and I can compress it. And if I can do that, compare the compressed version, it will be a lot faster. That's good. Uh, but I, I don't really know what I'm going, what I'm doing to compress it. So I'm going to think, okay, the information should be preserved. And again, if it's very blurry, like I don't blame you. It's kind of like when they say, you know, the uh, information should be preserved at the surface of black holes or something like. So I, I don't know what information means but surely information in the universe is preserved. I can't argue with that. Uh, so even though I have no clue really what's going on for now, um, I'm saying, okay, I compress the data, but I can guarantee actually that information is preserved. If I could decompress the, um, the data and find back my original image, if, if I can do that for sure information is preserved, um, and I've got something that is much smaller and should be faster to, to compare. So I think I'm on a, I'm on a good path here, and since I changed careers and came to Paltion and now I do AI and I know a lot about networks and I recognize, oh, but actually this loop, um, if I unroll it, I've got just a simple autoencoder. So it's just a simple network. You take the image, uh, you pass it through an encoder, so several layers of some network, and then you get some uh, state inside that is very compressed, and then you pass it through a several layers of decoders and you train the whole thing to reproduce exactly the input so that preserves my information but it's a neural network type of architectures and that's very good for me because i know i can throw like a lot of types of that i could throw text i could throw numbers i could throw uh, a mix of images and something else and I, I could still kind of make this architecture work so that's very good for me and like mostly there are also these um, neural network is kind of mostly continuous function, maybe uh, not all the time, but at least, and you can train it with some, you put some noise in the input and you try to reconstruct the original one and the output. So you've got some, um, some kind of confidence that if the image at the input is uh, changed only a little bit, then my compressed version will change also only a little bit as well. And that should help me to compare them later on. So I'm quite happy about this um, this architecture. I'm, I think, okay, neural networks, that's that's pretty good for me. Uh, but I have a, a kind of doubts that come in the back of my mind now, which is, okay, this compressed version, if I pass two images to my network, compare, compare it at the state where it's compressed, can I really do the comparison? And I've got a big problem here. Um, 
I mean, I mean, surely it works, and I mean, it's something some people do it sometimes, um, and it could work. But I've got this big uh, doubt that is, if the encoder and decoder can be as complex as they want. Uh, maybe I don't have this guarantee that I can make this comparison very easily because maybe the encoder learns something very complicated like the zip algorithm or some MD5 hash function and the decoder learns something very complicated like how to unzip it or how to kind of hack the hash function and my auto encoder would still work uh, as such but in the middle I have very little confidence that I could compare like you can't compare two zip files byte by byte um, so I'm a bit troubled by that, uh, but I think, okay, if the problem is that my decoder can be arbitrarily complex, if that creates a problem or if, if it could create a problem for me, I'm going to make it simple. And what I mean by simple is that I'll take the decoder and maybe it's uh, like several layers that make some network of its own. And I'm going to say, okay, I make it simple. I make it one layer. Only one layer is what is allowed to, for the decoder. And then I, I again, if, if uh, from some compressed data, only one layer is able to tell what it is or to reconstruct it, uh, the compressed version should be highly structured itself uh, because you don't do a lot of operations to get back the original image. Uh, so that's good. But if I build a network like this, I'm worried now that I will never be able to train it uh, because the decoder is so simple. You've got some very compressed data and you're trying to recreate an entire image pixel by pixel, but the decoder is so simple, maybe all you can do is something kind of ugly and it will never match and training will never work and you won't be able to, to, to do that actually. Um, but I really liked the, the path that I've been going down so far. So I'm going to say something, I'm going to say, okay, maybe I don't need to preserve all the information, but maybe some information could be preserved. So if I take my image, compress it, and then I have my simple decoder, which I like, and I'm gonna say, okay, you know what? It's okay if you tell me the image is Sam. There's some information in there, so I know you have uh, remembered something, you, you understand more or less the image, uh, but this is, um, this is now trainable. And in fact, if you flip it uh, from horizontal to vertical, it's like a very basic, classification network and they're all over the place and it's like super quick, super easy. There's many variations you can do, uh, very well known. So you can pick any kind of compressor that you want. You've got BERT for text, but you, for the image, you've got BGG that's from like way back, your mobile net, any network you want. Basically, you can use it like this. You pick in the middle is your compressed version. Uh, and then you've got your simple decoder that learns, make sure that the compressed version learns something useful. Um, and now I'm quite happy and I want to know, okay, but I had the number before, 97.6% uh, similar. Um, how do I get from classifier network and this compressed version to this number? And this is where the cosine similarity comes in. Um, and then it's um, a lot of people talk about it and so on. And um, I wanted to, in the beginning, I'd, Thought, okay, you could do any comparison you want, it should more or less work, but this one always comes back. So let's try to find out exactly what makes it so uh, popular, this cosine similarity. So if we take the kind of simple classification network, you've got the input, uh, some image, then you pass it through a big network that compresses it. Then you've got one layer that just decodes and says it's this category or not. And here we have one that uh, is very simple and its task is just to say, is the image a horse or not? Um, and let's look at what this is doing. So the first part, you take the image and you compress it with some VGG or some specifically um, neural, like convolution neural network for, that is very good for images. And then you get just a vector of few values. So I, I keep here in this example only two values. Um, so at some point, that's what the data is reduced to. And I say, okay, but these two values, they are the coordinates of a point. So I can have, uh, I have two of them, so I have a 2D plane. And okay, if I show this image, it compresses it to these coordinates, and that's this point uh, over there. Um, and then if we would go down again in the network, what the decoder or, 
or the kind of decompressor does. Again, this decompressor is very simple. It's one layer. It can't do a lot of operations. So the only thing it can do is draw a line. It draws a line somewhere. And then it says everything on the right side of this line is a horse. Everything on the wrong side uh, is not a horse. And then you train the whole thing together. And then the VGG learns to put the points in one half of the plane. And the decoder learns to put the line um, that makes it work. And then when training is finished, you end up that every image of a horse that you could show will end up on one side of the line and images that are not a horse will end up on the other side and it's not really a cosine similarity and now i just have a big cloud of points in half my plane uh, i don't see really how that's so useful but if i add another category now i'll train my network again with two categories and it has to say if it's a horse or a dolphin um, and i i train it so it learns to put the points and and draw the lines in a way that that works that it is actually able to solve this task now i've got two clouds of points and then the lines probably that the each decoder draws is some, something kind of in the middle and indeed something that's a dolphin is not a horse so it's on the wrong side of the horse line and so on uh, and now i've got two clouds of points if i would do that and i still maybe don't see so well why it's interesting so i i try to do it with another category now i add the uh, the mighty tiger in in the mix and uh, now i see some kind of structure so again the tiger it, it learns you train the line and the dots together so that every image of a dot of a tiger in the, is on the right li side of the tiger line but the horses and the dolphin are not tigers so they're, they're both on the wrong line uh, sorry on the wrong side and the, it works for each of these categories and now i'm starting to to see some kind of structure that comes uh, in how my coordinates are created and instead of adding all the animals in the world i'm gonna i'm gonna do it uh, one more step with only 10 categories uh, and to save some computation time i won't do it with images of animals i'm going to do it with mnist so just images of handwritten uh, digits and so i take a lot of these images uh, and i train my network to recognize each category like an image like this okay my network has to tell me it's a three so it puts the points of three here and it puts the three lines here um, and indeed by having all these categories that are all mutually exclusive i've got this circular um, kind of structure that emerges that that is the the only way to fit all these categories that are I have to fit in in my plane but they they have to be every time on one one on the wrong line of on the wrong side of the other and so on uh, and in the middle you can see even like okay like the bad images with almost nothing on it they end up kind of in the middle in the wrong line of every category on the wrong side of every category um and then the radius uh, we could say uh, i mean you, you could deal with it or not but um the thing is that the, the radius doesn't really matter it can it can be large or small but what i see is that really if i want to compare two images i compress them to these points and then just by looking at the angle i, I see that the angle between the each category this is kind of a fixed uh, value every category is like at a different angle from the other one uh, and that's where this kind of uh, angular metrics come from and why you start doing cosine similarity and you do it because now we are kind of doing almost trigonometry and if you have bad uh, memories of trigonometry what's worse than trigonometry is trigonometry in degrees uh, because if I ask you 36 degrees like let's say relative to the purple point uh, I mean it's not that you can't answer it's like one tenth of a circle so you, you could find out but it's really not natural to think in degrees i think for most people at least so what i'm going to do is i i'm going to pass everything through the cosine function and for example something that's like oh 5.2 degrees cosine of that is 0 0.995 and 0 0.995 i know it's almost one it's very close it should be the same thing almost and in fact the two points um, that are 5.2 degrees apart are uh, in, the, in the same category even but the 36 degrees from earlier, if I take the cosine of it, it's 0 0.8. And 0 0.8, you probably a lot of people could say, okay, it's it's very close, but there's kind of 0 0.2 difference. It's 20%. It's uh, 
uh, it's close, but it's not the same thing, definitely. And in fact, yeah, the two points that are 36 degrees apart are in uh, different categories. They're even different numbers. Um, and so thinking in terms of uh, cosine like this, uh, it helps a lot to, to, I think, to understand the values that come out. You could work in degrees if you wanted to, um, but that would not be very practical, and the cosine makes it uh, a bit nicer and easier. So now we've got, we've seen, okay, if you compress the data, you can make search fast. And if you use a neural network and you compress it and then you use the cosine similarity, you've got a way to get numbers uh, that are as precise as you want. You can write as many decimals uh, and then you, you, you are able to then sort them and, and um, group them by distance and whatever. So you could say, okay, now you have a way actually to measure how much similar two things are. Um, so I think putting it all together uh, I would I would like to show a kind of demo and it's kind of a feature that uh, we're going to have at Beltarion that we're about to release and um, that kind of packs all all these things together uh, but I I won't do the demo live because I want to keep the pace and also it's not quite uh, released yet uh, but what I will do is that I will um, kind of uh, narrate how um, another demonstration that we had, which was internal for us, uh, I will just tell you how it went. So what you do is that you have a big catalog of images. Um, so you have thousands and thousands of uh, images that you want to be able to search through or you want to be able to compare with other things. Um, and like we as a business, we don't have really a, a specific task to do. so. My girlfriend likes birds, so I found some data sets of birds, sneaked them into the company, and now I've got developers uh, working on fine-tuning similarity network for, for the birds. Um, so that's what um, the example I'm going to show is for then. It's like a data set of birds, so you have thousands and thousands of images of birds. Uh, so what you do is you kind of load them up, so you, you could use our platform, or you just generally you think, okay, I'm load up all these images. Uh, and then you pick a model, you say, okay, I'm going to use, uh, I don't know, good old VGG or mobile net or efficient net or something. Okay, it's images, so I need a good network for images. Uh, so I say, you say, okay, I'll pick this one. And then you let this model index all of your images. You, you pass every image through the network, and then you look at the compressed version of it, and then you save it. And you kind of archive it in a, in a big index. And for in this index, for every image that you know, you get you keep also the compressed version, and this way. Oh, that's uh, I don't know uh, if it appears blurry on your screens as well. Anyway, the way you use it later on is that when you want to search an image, you get I don't know. You go in the wild and take a new picture, and you want to know if you had anything that looks like this in your uh, catalog that you have indexed. So what you do, you just compress the image with the same network. And then you can do, and my animation is appearing. And then you compare the compressed version with every compressed version that is in your index. And that can go very, very quickly because it's very small data and you do cosine similarity itself is super fast. So you do all the comparisons and then you say, okay, maybe you pick the top three closest matches. Uh, and then it looks like this. And again, it's a bit blurry, but Either maybe you see it well, or you can guess that it's a bird that's flying. Uh, and I can confirm to you that it's the same species of bird. Um, and then you're very happy, and the demonstration ends, and uh, everyone's uh, super happy. And really, I like, I'm very happy myself to do it because I've done that a couple of times with different data sets, and it's just crazy like how, how little effort and work you put, and already you get something that, okay, here's a bird, here's birds that, that, that look. There's a bunch of birds that look almost exactly like this. And you haven't even started to fine tune or train anything. You just run it and already you're like so far ahead. So everyone's very happy and then uh, the demonstration ends. But then we chat a bit and one, one of the developers then he said, okay, but is that really new? Because, you know, this uh, class, is it really similarity? You pass an image, okay, you do all these things we talked about. Or is it just a classification network? Like you, 
you take an image we know from from many years you can classify i don't know 500 species of birds you say what bird it is then you just search for this species of birds and return images uh, and it, it's a very valid question i think because um, as we've seen we use classification networks in kind of our architecture um, so it, it's a very valid question to have but i think it does uh, similarity does uh, do a little bit more and i think now is the time to talk about how you train these networks um, and I, I hope this this will say maybe in, in which way it's a bit different so if you were to actually train or maybe you want to fine-tune your network there's a couple of ways that you could do it uh, and there's maybe the most simplest way which is one I, I really like at the moment sometimes it's referred as instance classification so i said before you, you have an image you pass it you compress decompress it you want to recover it that's your autoencoder but i don't want the decoder to be too complex uh, but then that means i can't reconstruct the whole image so i have to make some concession and say i preserve only some of the information but now i think okay maybe i can keep this uh, classifier structure and keep all the information maybe my, now i have categories that are not just is it Sam is it which character or whatever is it a cat or a dog my classifier now is going to tell me okay this image is that one image from your collection number 59875 uh, that's that's this image and if you can do that you have preserved all information because even though you don't reconstruct pixel by pixel you're able to point at exactly the right one so in a way all information is preserved uh, and it's, it's this classifier uh, structure, which means that you can actually train it. Uh, and the inconvenience is that if you train a network like this, like you don't really have any information about the content of the image. So basically the network can see more or less shapes and colors, you know, and maybe organize images by shape and color, but you don't really add any information about the meaning of images. So you could do the classification. Now again, uh, I'm sorry if you see them blurry, I'm not sure why, but um, it's the same kind of uh, query than before. So if you train the network with classification, so it, it knows this is a bird, is this, it knows maybe some species of birds and so on. Uh, yes, so you show it then an image, then the most similar will be the same species of bird. But what's interesting, I think, is when you don't show the top three results, but you go a bit further, and you see, okay, maybe the most similar, they're actually all flyings. They are the same species, but they're all flying. And from memory, you have to go to down. So the similarity is about 0.76, and you have to go down to maybe 0 0.75, 0 0.74 before you see this bird kind of sitting on a on a branch or on the, the thing here. And as you continue, you can see, okay, maybe even less similar, it's still flying, but the background now is very brownish, like the tint has changed a lot. And if you go all the way and you pick the least similar, you, you will always see that it's some kind of really gray, gray bird sitting on, on noisy water. And so there, there's really something that it's not just the same species that it returns. There's also a visual component that is preserved. Uh, but adding the labels definitely add the meaning or to the image. What species is it? And that definitely helps to kind of narrow down the search. And in fact, you could do the same uh, you, you might want to train a multi-label problem where you have many criteria, like is it not only the species, but is it carnivore, is it aquatic, and so on. Uh, and I haven't done that one personally, but I would assume that the network organizes them in a way that makes sense. And maybe at some point you might need more than two dimensions to make it fit, but um, with some categories like this, you could, see, you could think that it, it's able to organize the dots. And something that I've done uh, myself, actually, is to even specify you, you can say how, how close you want two images to be so maybe i'm a mathematician and uh, to me like odd numbers uh, one three and five they're very similar together and even numbers are very similar together but odd and even for me it's very different things i put them on very different levels uh, but i'm kind of a sensible mathematician and i say consecutive numbers are still um, more similar when they're close together so for example, the image of a one compared to the category of one, I say this should be zero degree, it's the same thing. And in cosine similarity, it would tell me this is one. So the image of one compared to the class of one is similarity of one. Compared to a three, well, you know, one and three are consecutive. So 
I would like them to be maybe 22 degrees apart, which is uh, 0.92 in cosine similarity. So again, it's kind of very close, but not the same thing. Um, and but maybe one and zero, even though they are consecutive, they're odd and even. So I want them to be 90 degrees apart, which would give me a similarity of zero. Um, and so I can define my rules like this for every com combination of numbers that I want. Um, and since I train a classifier network, I use cross entropy, and then uh, you have this one hot vector, which I will say, okay, it's not a one hot anymore, it's really probability distribution. And I calculate the probability that kind of matches the, the values that, I've, that I want. And actually, yeah, if you train the network with this target instead of just a simple classifier of categories, uh, you, you give this specific probability distribution. The network learns to classify, okay, well, all the odd, odd numbers on one side, even numbers on the other side, and then they are consecutive and so on, and you have 90 degrees between odd and even at least. Um, so when you start stopping saying, okay, similar, maybe from a visual point of view, like when you say really similar to me, it means something, then you can write it down in math and train really precisely what you want and the network will just you know, try to try to make it fit and organize itself so that you get the points exactly where you want them. Um, and the last loss, um, uh, it's maybe, I think the most common, it's the one I, I like the least as well, but I, uh, I don't fancy it as much as the other ones, but it's very popular, so I just have to say a word about it. It's like contrastive loss. So, and it's very good when you don't have, when you don't know every pair of image that you have, what is their similarity, but you know it's for some pairs. So what you will do is you will show these two images. Uh, they are not the same, and so you compress them and you train the network so that after cosine similarity, the result is zero. And if you have a pair of image in your data set that you know they are the same, you show them to the network and say, I want the output after cosine similarity to be one. Uh, and you just train like this and you, you do with the pairs that you know about. Um, and then you, you train and that's, I think, quite uh, popular to do like that. Um, maybe because it's easier to find data like this. Uh, and then you can have every flavor, you can use the same network. You, you can not use cosine similarity anymore. You can have another network if you want. Everyone can do their own kind of recipe with this thing. And then you can have also uh, triplet loss, which is the same thing, but you show images basically three by three. And then I joke that maybe next year we'll show images eight by eight. Um, but you can see that as you start doing this for more and more images, it becomes the same as specifying for every possible pair by hand. Uh, exactly what you want. Um, yeah, and so that was the uh, ways to train it. So I hope uh, you have been able to follow um, well enough. And to summarize, so I would say the similarity, it's a way to take like this abstract domain uh, or this abstract idea that things are, ah, it's kind of similar, but you get a number that you, you can use to build a system, you can build a product around it, like. You, you get a numerical value out of it. Uh, and by using network or neural networks, you can do it from like uh, pretty much any kind of data and then you can do it uh, very fast because then it's compressed value. Uh, it's, very, it's very quick to compare. Um, and then you use cosine similarity. So that's how you get down to your final, final numbers. Um, yeah, and then you could train, it's, it's pretty open, I would encourage everyone to experiment uh, you, because you could train that without any labels at all, just from the images themselves. You could add some information uh, or you can have even, you don't, you don't add information about class, like this is a bird, this is a cat, whatever. You could say just these two images are similar. I don't know why, but they're similar and you just train your network like this. Um, that's also possible and quite uh, commonly done, I think, right now. Um, yeah, and that was it. And so now I think, I hope we have some time. I think I went a bit over, um, but if there are questions, I will be happy to take them. Perfect, thank you very much, Romain. Uh, we had some questions. Um, the first question uh, is about the, uh, well, it relates, or we can make these two questions into one. So the first question is like, does amplitude, uh, distance from the center of the cloud of the cosine similarity, I guess, 
uh, in the two two dimensional encoding D does that represent uncertainty of the classification and and how can it be used uh, and and the other question is is also about uh, um, how do you interpret like if you get a uh, you get a, a probability that these uh, pictures are are similar to each other uh, or that they uh, are to a, to a specific class how do you quantify uncertainty uh, more broadly speaking maybe so, so yeah so i i will well, maybe i'm not sure how i how quickly i can find my plot again but so yeah, this this radius thing. Um, I think for me at the moment it's it's something more that uh, annoys me. So what it means is that if you have even um, the one with the lines. So if you have a line, I don't know if you see my mouse as well, or if we should have a point. Yeah, we do. we see it. So maybe you have the line here that represents okay everything on on the left. Oops, I should not click. On the left of it will be a three. Uh, then what the radius means is kind of the confidence of the network, so something that is with a larger radius, so the last point here, uh, the, it means the model is really, really sure it's a three, but you know, you've got points here that are, the, mod, the model thinks, you know, with 95% confidence it's a three and so on, and at some point, like if it knows it's a three, the radius doesn't really matter anymore. As as soon as it goes kind of over the line, uh, or maybe one space, one sort of uh, reasonable distance from this line, you should be confident it's a three, and then the radius doesn't matter anymore. And there's like a big um, problem I think with uh, this radius is that if the model would be hundred percent sure that it's a three, so if this image is there, okay, you you want the model, you should, the model should be able to tell you this is a three with 100% certainty. It's it's very clear that this image is a three. Uh, the problem is in the numerics of how it is. The model can never output one. It's always limited to 0 0.999999. Uh, so it, it's something the model mathematically is not able to say 100%, uh, but the training algorithm uh, this wants to get 100%. So what you do is that what happens is that the radius increases to infinity, and the the only way, like like a point which would have 100% certainty to be a three, would have an infinite radius. Uh, and I don't think that's very very useful. Um, like at some, especially when you're comparing uh, images, then like have the the radius doesn't matter. It's like if you're 0 0.99999 percent, it's a three. It will it will have a radius of uh, 20 meters. But if you're only 0 0.999 percent, it's a three. The radius will be a lot different. Uh, but the the meaning of it, I, I mean, this is all pretty much uh, meaningless. So that's why I, I don't uh, count the the radius so much. And this is why also the cosine similarity is so used, I think, because then the angle tells you something that okay it's between different classes or there's something else going on than just uh, the certainty so if you took the euclidean distance between two points so again one point that would have just 0.999 percent chance to be a three would have a very large euclidean distance from a point that is 0 0.9999 percent chance to be a three just because of this radius uh, so that's why uh, sometimes you, you can compare points by just the distance between them it's definitely possible but this radius it's kind of because it goes to infinity when the more you're sure uh it, it kind of messes up things and then the angle doesn't have this problem every point that is at a different angle it's kind of a different class so it, it represents a different thing for the model I, right uh, yeah um the second question is how would you apply this method to compare image similarities between images where you only have one class. For instance, we had a real industry project where we had the time series images. The images were extracted every 10 minutes from a video stream and consecutive image, images looked almost the same. Over time, there was a slow buildup of change uh, of the images in the video stream. And what, what we needed to do uh, was to extract the data set of images uh, 
from a raw dump, it was 30 gigabyte of images, so that the images in the extracted data set were dissimilar enough. Uh, so, uh, do you understand the question, Romain? Like, how would you apply this method to compare image similarities between images where you only have one class? Yeah, so, so then I think this uh, method of instance classification, uh, maybe, that's, maybe that's the only thing you can do, because then you don't have any labels, you don't have any annotation for it, so you just learn from the image itself. Um, and this kind of, at the end I presented as kind of instance classification, but it's very close to what um, I guess a data scientists would tell you, do an autoencoder where you don't have any extra information, but you just compress it and try to find again, uh, pre preserve the information that you have, even though you don't know what this information is or what you should look at. Uh, but then you you go back. So you, if you have images doing the autoencoder, uh, like I said, I, I don't trust really the decoder that it fits too complex. Um, I don't trust that then the compressed version is comparable, but um, I mean, uh, it, it, it has been done before, so it, it's not something that's outlandish either. But also, if you compress the, or if you simplify the decoder, then you get the same autoencoder. You you think in terms of classes with like, so if your your live stream, I don't know, then you end up with a hundred thousand images uh, from a sequence, I don't know, over some some minutes. Uh, then you have a hundred thousand classes, and you just train the network to recognize each image individually. Um, and this technique, so you, you don't need as much data, it's more, the, it's closer to the autoencoder principle where you don't add any labels, uh, but at the same time, I, th I think it will be um, maybe worth to think a bit more also, you can't just apply it like with the bird, just en encode and then you get the same birds, um, because then, yeah, you have a lot less information to start from, so I think then you have to be a bit more careful as well in um, how, you, how you would do that. Yep. Uh, then the last question I think we will have time for um, is um, how do you find the final missing piece and which machine learning algorithm uh, such as KNN do you use to compute for this approach? Uh, we just got this question. Uh, how? I'm not sure if you understand that. No. Um, uh, how do you know the? Uh, how do you know and find the final missing piece? Uh, okay. Uh, the other question is: How does uh, these um, kind of neural networks work on a, a bit easier problems? Uh, so, for instance, if you have tabular data where you only have like 10 variables and it's a classification uh, problem. Uh, well, I guess it, it uh, depends, like, for, for, first of all, it will run a lot faster since you don't have to process the images. But I, I guess you, you could do... Uh, you could do pretty much the same principle. So, the, I think one thing that's uh, kind of helps, like it, it helps me a lot to think in terms of these, when you have the compressor, so a data scientist will tell you, okay, it's the, an embedding of the data, um, and but I think of, about uh, really a point, if I have two coordinates, it's a point in the plane, uh, and then you could think, so you, you could have a data with a series of numbers, um, then you just pass them through a network, you, so you put a few layers of dense thing, dense blocks or whatever, uh, and then you end up at some point with just a vector of uh, maybe two values or three values or four values. That's like the compressed version. It's the embedding of it. Uh, and then I would think, okay, this um, this embedding, if it was coordinates uh, in a plane or in 3D or in 4D or 5D, where would I want them to be so that when I give them new data, it should end up somewhere near. And then when I do this comparison between the points, uh, it will tell me is it closer to these points or closer to these points. Um, so, so for, for for me, it helps a lot to think that this embedding, it's a point in in the plane or in 3D, and where do I want it? Where do I want the model to put this point? Yeah. And then it doesn't really matter if it's image or a bunch of values or text or whatever. Yeah. 
Oh, that's interesting. All right, um, we are running out of time. Um, but I guess if you have questions, you can reach out to Romain uh, on uh, on LinkedIn or or any other place like that. Yeah, for sure. Um, so uh, thank you, Romain, very much for an interesting presentation, and thank you to all the attendees. Um, uh, make sure to uh, to become a member of the Stockholm Data Science Meetup, uh, and then you will get more invitations. Uh, for this, uh, we usually do this as a physical uh, thing where we meet up, uh, grab a beer and talk data science. But since that's not possible right now, uh, we'll be doing uh, maybe some more webinars. And then uh, once this shit has blown over, um, we can start meeting uh, face to face. Uh, but uh, thank you uh, everyone very much uh, and uh, I'll hope to see you soon. Well, thanks a lot for listening. Yeah. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you.